recording this um, so that people that weren't able to be on here tonight can watch and learn with us. Um, this program series is brought to you by our Youth, Nature, and the Outdoor Environment Program Work Team. It's a lot of words, but they're 4-H educators all around the state in a lot of the counties, most of the counties. And we come together to do programs like this and to do training programs for our staff. And then we hope to see you all at the fair this summer at the state fair. So I'm gonna jump our slide here. Um, and I'm gonna transfer the mic to Sarah and go back. Hi everybody, I'm Sarah from um, Columbia and Green Counties, and I'm really excited to introduce our speaker tonight, Dylan. Dylan and I worked together for many years at the Albany Pine Bush, and Dylan is the field ecologist and entomologist there, and she studies um, and teaches people about all kinds of different insects, including bees and dragonflies and butterflies. We'll let her tell us more about that. But the cool thing about Dylan is she's actually also a former 4-H member. When she was a kid, she was in 4-H for, we were debating um, today, maybe 10 years or more. She was part of a club called the Cato Clever Clovers. Um, and she did public presentations and fashion review and participated in her county and in the state fair too. So, um, I'm really excited to let Dylan teach us more about insects. So I'm going to turn it right over to you, Dylan. All right. Thanks so much, Sarah. And thank you so much for inviting me to do this. This is, I'm pretty excited. This is uh, my first time um, going back to 4-H. So pretty exciting. All right, let me share my screen. All right, so I'm just gonna start off tonight with a couple questions. Um, and you can either type your answers into the chat or you can unmute yourself and shout out some answers if you want. So we're going to start tonight with what is an insect? What makes an insect an insect? Anybody know? Ooh, six legs, wings. Three parts, I forgot the names, that's okay. Three parts is great. Head, thorax, abdomen, nice, yep. Tiny, <laughs> yes, some of them are very small. Bones, they have bones, but they're different from our bones. We'll talk a little bit about that. Yep, six legs, three body parts. You guys are you guys are getting them. Exoskeleton. God, yes, good job, Shirley. Antenna, yes. Some are aquatic. Yes, you are absolutely right. Wow. Are you guys sure you need me? It kind of seems like you guys know a lot about insects. Um so yeah, great job, everybody. So yeah, let's start off with this body form, right? They have these three body parts, um, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. And the head is where we're gonna find those antenna that somebody mentioned. So many insects have antenna. Sometimes these antenna are really modified and very cool looking. Um, you also find their mouth parts on their head as well as their eyes. And then in the thorax, this is kind of that middle part of the body, that's where you'll find that the wings and the legs attach. So some of you mentioned that some of them have wings um, and they all have these six legs. So all of those body parts attach to that middle part, the thorax. And then we have this um, abdomen at the end. Um, so yeah, you guys did a great job. Oh, someone says they can't hear me. Can, can you guys, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, Chance, I'm not sure. You might need to turn your volume up. 
um, or adjust which speaker. Um, and then some people mention this exoskeleton. So yes, so there are some things that we have in common with insects. We're animals, right? We're living things. Um, we have, we breathe, we eat, um, we have blood, we have lots of things that are kind of similar, but many things are obviously very different. And one of those things is the exoskeleton. So our skeleton is on the inside and insects that exoskeleton, that skeleton is on the outside. That's why we call it an exoskeleton. The exo means out. So their, their skeleton is actually on the outside of their body. Um, insects also don't have a backbone. So we have a backbone um, and many other animals like squirrels and fish, um, horses, turtles, frogs, all of those animals have backbones. Insects do not have backbones. So this is a fun illustration, but let's get into some nitty gritty and look at this on a real insect, okay? So here we have a butterfly, all right? So on this butterfly, we can see this thorax portion in the middle. That's where these big, beautiful scaled wings are attached. Um, at the back here, we have the abdomen. And then up here at the front is the head and you can see those eyes and you can see those really big, very cool antennae that are modified with these clubs on the end. So that's a butterfly. This is a very different looking insect. This is a dragonfly. So again, we have this nice head. We have a thorax where we have the legs and those wings attached. But on these dragonflies, we have this really long, skinny abdomen. And that's kind of characteristic of these types of insects. And also on our dragonflies here, they have these teeny tiny, very, very small antennas. They're not very big at all. They almost just looks like a little hair coming out there. And then here's another insect. So um, this insect, again, we've got our head here at the front. I got a little bit of a longer thorax this time and all of those wings and legs are attached to that thorax. And the abdomen here is actually hidden by these wings that are held kind of roof-like over the abdomen and kind of hide that abdomen. And the antenna on this insect are pretty crazy, really long and kind of filamentous like strings. All right, I have another quiz question for you guys. How many eyes do insects have? So again, you can type it in the chat or you can, yep, I'm seeing two, I'm seeing hundreds, getting a lot of twos. Lots of twos, all right, good job, yeah. So here, here we go. Here's a here's a um, an insect face. This is the face of one of those dragonflies, and yeah, they have these two big compound eyes. And somebody said hundreds. You're not you're not wrong with hundreds either, because these compound eyes are actually made up of hundreds of smaller, teeny tiny eyes called omatidia. And you can kind of see them in this picture here. All of these little teeny little circles in this compound eye are little omatidia that make up this compound eye. So yeah, you can kind of think of it as many eyes. But what you may not have known is that this is another insect. This is a bee. There's those two compound eyes on either side of the head. But up here on the top are three more eyes that are modified really just for kind of sensing light. And they call these type these eyes ocelli. They're usually located on the top of the head um, and it kind of helps the insects orient themselves in the habitat. So they know that the sky is above them and the ground is below them. So they're very, very simple eyes. They don't really process images or see pictures, but it helps them orient their bodies. Now, if you want to type some more in the chat, you can. Um, you guys, uh, I saw some great answers to this question um, already about what are some of your favorite insects or what are some insects that you know. So you can, if you have any more to add, you can go ahead and add them in the chat. I'm going to go over a few of the groups. Um, there are millions of species of insects and many of them we don't even know. We haven't even identified yet. Um, so this is going to be a pretty broad, big picture, but hopefully these are some insects that you are familiar with. So I'm going to start off with some of our oldest insects. So these are some of the insects that have been around for the longest time. So some of these insects have been around for longer than the dinosaurs. So these are mayflies and stoneflies. 
And these guys, some of you mentioned at the beginning of the talk too, that some insects are aquatic. These guys are what we might call semi-aquatic. So they start their life cycles in the water. Um, and then as adults, they leave the water and they have usually have very short lives as adults. So in the water, they can live for years. And as adults, they may only live for a few days. Um, and these guys, because they kind of bridge those habitats between aquatic and land um, systems, they can be really good indicators of habitat quality. So seeing these um, species can help scientists learn what the health of an ecosystem is. So those are our mayflies and our stoneflies. Another fairly old group are our dragonflies and damselflies. So I have one of each pictured here. The dragonfly is here on the right. So dragonflies have really robust kind of thick abdomens. So remember that's that last body part here. Um, and they have, they hold their wings kind of out across their back. So they kind of look like a T shape. They have a T shape. And those two wings are actually different shapes. So if you were to stack them on top of each other, they wouldn't quite stack because they're, they're shaped a little bit differently. Um, over here is our damselfly, and you can already see there the damselflies hold their wings a little bit differently. So they're holding the wings kind of closed over the abdomen. And those wings, um, they have also have four wings, but they're all the same shape. So when those wings are stacked over each other, um, they just kind of stack up really nice because they all have the same shape. These guys are also aquatic um, as nymphs. That's what we call a young um dragonfly or damselfly. They're a nymph when they're not an adult. Um, so they are in aquatic systems and they don't usually stray very far from ponds or streams or where they grew up as nymphs. They're some of my favorite insects. Now the antlions and lace wings are also another pretty old group. It's one you may not encounter very often. Um, so antlions are very, very small. They're only maybe like that big little bitty guys, um, and you can see why they're called lace wings. They have these very lacy kind of clear wings. Over here on the left is an antlion, which kind of looks a little bit like a damselfly, but they have way cooler antennae up here. You can see these really beautiful long curled antennae. And these guys as um, larvae actually look very different. This is the nymph or the larvae of an antlion. Um, so you can see it looks very different than the adult. And this is where they actually spend most of their time. So they live for two or three years as these larvae and they actually live in the ground. So this, um, they're called antlines because they make a little pit in the sand and they sit at the bottom of that pit. And you can see this is the head here and they have these big massive jaws. And those massive jaws are what they use to catch prey when they fall into the sandy pit and fall down into the middle. Those jaws will close and they'll pull it down and eat it. So these are pretty cool insects. The lacewing larvae are also very, very voracious predators as, as young lacewings. Then we move into the grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids. These groups you may hear more often than you see. These guys have an ability to do what we call stridulate, which is make sounds. They rub different parts of their bodies together. Sometimes they rub their legs together. Sometimes they rub their wings together. Um, and there's a little comb structure on one side. So when they rub the other um, body part over the top of it, it makes this sound. And you can actually identify these animals by the sounds they make. They all make unique sounds because what they're doing is trying to con communicate to other species, um, other animals in their species. So you can actually identify them by their sounds. So many of the species in this group that make some really, really cool sounds. And then this is my group, guys. This is the group that I spend a lot of time working with. I really love these guys. It was hard for me to limit the number of pictures that I showed you. Um, but the bees, um, ants, and wasps, um, these guys are pretty cool. And they, um, they have a pretty broad range in how they live. So some of these guys live in social colonies. So they live together with lots of other individuals. So we see that a lot in ants. We'll see that in some of our bees, like honeybees. And in those situations, there's one queen who is laying all the eggs. And all of these are female workers that are helping to take care of and maintain the nest. So all of these workers are the ones that go out and find food, they'll bring it back to the nest. They take care of the young, they remove waste, 
They protect the nest from predators. Um, so it's a pretty cool system. And in the bees, we see some bees, like I said, like honeybees that are social and have and live in these colonies. But many of our bees are actually solitary and they live all by themselves. Um, but also in this group, we'll find some really crazy looking animals. This guy up here is called an ensign wasp. He's called an ensign because it looks like she's flying a little flag. You can see her abdomen is really, really constricted. And then she has this big kind of bulbous abdomen. And it kind of looks like her abdomen is actually like she's waving a flag. So that's called an ensign wasp. These guys are very, very small. This is actually a photo under a micro under a dissecting microscope. So this wasp is only a couple millimeters in length. We also have some um, parasitoid wasps. So these are wasps that actually find the eggs or larvae of other insects and lay their eggs inside of them. So it's kind of like it, they're aliens almost. Um, and they're really important. They can control the populations of some of those animals so they don't reach pest proportions. Um, uh, these wasps over here are also predatory. This is a special wasp called a cicada killer. And these wasps specialize on cicadas. This is what they co they collect and feed their young. So these guys will stock a nest with a bunch of cicadas. They'll lay an egg and then they'll close it off and that egg will hatch and eat those cicadas. And then the next year they will come out as an adult wasp. So there's a lot of really cool different um, biologies and ecologies of these insects, which is why they're studied a lot by scientists. We also have the true bugs. So you've probably heard the term bug. And, you know, you might mean that to mean, you know, that's kind of a term, a common name that people might use to describe, you know, they might call a bee a bug, or you might call a butterfly a bug, or, you know, you might call a spider a bug. Um, but the term bug actually refers to a very specific group of insects. Um, and these are the true bugs. So this the contained in this group are cicadas, like you see here. These are some other insects that have the ability to stridulate and sing songs. So you probably have heard cicadas singing in the summer months. It's kind of like a high, um, high pitch kind of buzz noise. And again, you can identify the species based on how their sound, what their sound um, is. Um, aphids are also in this group. So if you've ever had seen aphids um, uh, on your plants, they're also a true bug. Um, and then this is kind of a very typical true bug. So this, this group has a pretty wide range in what they look like, um, but this is what we would kind of call a true bug. They have sucking mouth parts. So whereas a lot of our other species have had chewing mouth parts where they can kind of, they've got actual mandibles that they can take bites out of things and chew. Um, these guys have sucking mouth parts. And sometimes if they're, you know, sometimes they'll suck on plants and that's what aphids do. That's why you find them on, on stems and stuff. Um, but some of these guys are predatory. So they eat other insects. And in some cases, these guys here are called giant water bugs or sometimes referred to as toe biters. Um, and they're pretty big. These guys can be about three inches long and they will eat tadpoles and small fish. Um, so they have a really sharp beak that they can then stab in and then they will inject digestive juices and then kind of drink that meal like through a straw. It's pretty cool. But as you might guess, they're called toe biters because they can bite people. And sometimes these guys are in um, wetlands. And sometimes if you step on one, I've never been bitten by one. So I don't know if people just gave them this name because they were afraid of getting bitten in the toes by them. Most insects are going to leave you alone. They don't, they're more scared of you than you are of them. Um, but these are some cool bugs. Um, I see in the chat, I like to collect cicada exoskeletons. I did that as a kid too. It's so much fun. If you go out at nighttime with a flashlight at the right time of year, sometimes you can find them just when they have crawled out of the ground because they're going to crawl up trees, right? That's where you find those exoskeletons. Um, if you go out at night, you can find them right when they've crawled out and you can actually watch them hatch out of those exoskeletons. And it's really cool because they're usually really pretty colored um, when they first hatch out. Okay, 
Now, Beatles. So again, this is a group that's really hard to do justice to in just one slide because this is actually our most diverse group of insects. So there are the, all over the world, there are the most species of insects in the beetle group. So there's tons of different kinds. I've tried to showcase some different forms of beetles here. Up here in the upper left here is actually one of our native ladybird beetles. Sometimes you might call them ladybugs. Um, there's a, you probably have seen, you may have seen some of the non-native ladybugs in your house. They were um, introduced to actually control aphids on crops. So they were introduced to try and control a pest um, a species, and they have now reached pest <laughs> status. And you'll see them frequently in the fall. They try to come into your house where it's warm because they're looking for a place to overwinter. Um, and actually with these warm days that we've been having, they're probably starting to wake up and you might see them start crawling around the house. Um, also in this group are some aquatic beetles. This is a water scavenger beetle um, that spends most of its life underwater. Um, and also a cool characteristic of these beetles is you'll notice like you don't really see any membranous wings, right? Um, these guys, they, they have four sets or four wings, so two sets of two. But the outer wings are hardened into these, um, they're almost, we call them elytra. Um, and they're really hardened and they're protecting membranous wings underneath. So these guys do have wings that are membranous and look like some of the other insects. They're just kind of folded up and protected under these elytra. Um, so all of these guys have those beautiful elytra. There's some really pretty um, be beetles here. Um, some dung beetles. Um, unfortunately, some of our prettiest, like most metallic and rainbow colored beetles are sometimes dung beetles. And these guys literally feed on dung. So they are decomposers. They help break down poop in the environment. Um, and some of them are really, really beautiful. This is a type of uh, ground beetle. And up here is a darkling beetle. And these guys live in really dry environments. And you see them a lot um, when you find them, they kind of stand on their heads. And the thought is that they're doing that um, because they live in deserts. They're trying to get the moisture to condense and then drip down their bodies into their mouths. So they'll a lot of times kind of sleep overnight, almost doing handstands. And you can find them in the morning still doing their little handstands. Um, so incredible amount of diversity in the beetles. And then another group you might be familiar with are the moths and butterflies. I think I saw some moths and butterflies listed when you guys talked about your favorite bugs or some ones you knew about. Um, so these guys also have four wings, but those wings aren't membranous anymore. They're covered with scales, which is kind of different, right? When you think of scales, you might think of um, reptiles, right? You might think of snakes or turtles, and you might think of those kind of scales. These are different kind of scales. Um, and they're really, really tiny. And sometimes if you ever held a moth or um, picked up a moth or a butterfly, you'll see they actually come off on your hands. You can actually see them come off. Um, and they are able to give these animals really incredible colorations. So we've got a whole variety here. We've got a couple moths down here, the Luna moth. Um, this is a buck moth. Up here is a really cool looking moth. It's one of the clear winged moths. So this is one that actually does have more membranous wings. It doesn't have those scales on the wings. Um, and they are thought to be mimicking bumblebees. And then up here, we've got a couple little butterflies that we have here where I work in the pine bush. This is a pine elfin and a carner blue, which of course I have to mention because that's our federally endangered species here. We do a lot of work to restore this species. Um, and of course, these guys also have a caterpillar stage, right? So this is an example. This is actually the caterpillar of the Inland Barrens buck moth. So you could encounter these adults flying around, or you can find the caterpillars a lot of times too. I've got a couple other ones that I wanted to sneak in just because they're pretty cool insects. Um, and I think you may have seen them. So walking sticks, we do actually have um, native walking sticks around here. This is one of our native walking sticks. You, They're really hard to find because they're really, really well camouflaged. Um, as you can imagine, you can see all the grass in the background on this picture. Um, I'm pretty lucky whenever I find a walking stick because they blend in incredibly well. And that's what they're trying to do, right? They, they're trying to avoid um, getting eaten by predators. And they've taken that 
to another level by basically just looking like a stick that can walk around. Um, and mantids. So these are pretty cool insects too. And these, we um, actually, we have a couple introduced mantids in New York state. One's Chinese, one's from China and one's from Europe. Um, and they were introduced again as a way to control pests on crops. Um, so you can see these a lot in both the, the walking sticks and the mantids you're more likely to see in the late summer or in the early fall because they're getting bigger as the season progresses. So it's harder to see them when they're really small early in the season and early in the summer. But as they get bigger and bigger and bigger later in the season, it becomes easier to see them. Um, so, all right, uh, one more group here I could not pass up are the flies. Now, when you think of flies, you might think of I think I saw somebody put gnats in the chat and mosquitoes. So there are many flies that, you know, are kind of a nuisance to us or a pest to us. Um, and but there are a lot of other different kinds of flies and some of them are are really beautiful flies. So up here um, in the upper right, we have a hoverfly. These guys are actually pollinators. They move pollen from one flower to another, which is what's necessary in order for plants to produce seeds and fruits. So they're pretty important. This guy up here looks like a bumblebee and it's actually trying to look like a bumblebee in order to lure prey in. It's trying to, you know, make other insects feel like they're safe because this is actually a predatory insect. This is a robber fly. Um, and they're trying to look like a bumblebee so that they can trick the other insects to co into coming close to them. Um, but they actually eat other insects. This guy down here, I think it's a really cute fly. To me, it looks a little bit like a bunny rabbit, but it doesn't have the best life history. This is a bot fly. Um, if you've ever heard of bot flies, uh, bot flies actually lay their eggs. Um, they lay larvae actually on mammals. And then those larvae burrow into the skin and live in the skin and live a little pocket in the skin. Um, and then they actually pupate under the skin and then pop out as adults. So they're kind of gross, but it's, it's a pretty cute looking fly, I think. Um, so flies are certainly a huge part of um, our daily lives and maybe in a ways that we don't even know. All right. So we mentioned that um, insects have this exoskeleton, right? Um, if you think about it, uh, it would be pretty hard to grow, right? If your skeleton was on the outside of your body. Um, and so insects have kind of interesting ways in which they grow. We've talked a little bit about it when we talked about the cicada shedding their skin when they crawl out of the ground. Um, but before we get to that, I just want to talk about um, this idea of metamorphosis, which is changing from um, one stage of life to another stage of life. And in insects, we see two types of metamorphosis. We see complete metamorphosis, and the example here is the monarch butterfly. So in complete metamorphosis, um, that they start as an egg. Um, they hatch into a larva. That larva then turns into a chrysalis or a pupa in moths and butterflies and other animals that's sometimes encased in another um, silken cocoon on the outside. Um, and then they hatch out of that chrysalis as an adult. So this is complete metamorphosis. We have four stages here. We've got egg, larva, pupa, and adult. Um, so many of our insects, flies, um, bees and wasps, um, butterflies, beetles, all of those insects um, exhibit complete metamorphosis. So they have those four life stages. Some insects, like pictured here, like grasshoppers, katydids, um, Let's see, uh, the dragonflies and damselflies, um, mayflies, stoneflies, these guys all have incomplete metamorphosis. So they start from an egg and they hatch, but these guys don't have a pupil stage. So they never go into a pupa or a chrysalis. They just kind of keep growing. Um, and you'll see this word molt here. So that exoskeleton, hard, because it's so hard on the outside of the body, in order for these animals to grow, they actually have to shed that exoskeleton. Um, so here's an example of, this is a damselfly. This is a series of photos of a damselfly shedding its exoskeleton. So this is a, um, a nymph that's just crawled out of the water. Um, it's clinging to a blade of grass. 
And you can see it just split the back of its exoskeleton here and it's just pulling itself out. Almost there, it's got that thorax and the head. These are the little teeny tiny wing pads that are gonna expand. And here it is, finally pulled that big long abdomen out. And you can see this one is already pumped those a bunch of um, insect blood or hemolymph through those wings. So those wings have opened up and become fully open here. But you can see this, this insect still looks, it looks kind of green, right? It's a little bit light colored. So this is a, what we would call tenoral. This insect is still kind of soft. So that exoskeleton takes time to harden. So this insect is very vulnerable right now. It'd be very easy to eat um, because that, that exoskeleton isn't hardened yet. As that exoskeleton hardens, that insect is going to turn a darker color and it's it's really it's going to harden up. So it's not going to be as soft. Um, so this is that damselfly completely out of that exoskeleton. So this is an example of incomplete metamorphosis, no pupil stage. Um, but it is a pretty drastic change, right, from going from underneath the water to above the water. So they're a pretty cool insect. All right, so what are some ways that insects defend themselves? Um, so this is defending themselves from, from predators, from, from other insects, and sometimes from us, right? So one of the first lines of defense is to camouflage yourself. So we saw that with the walking stick. We see that here with this Katie did. So camouflage is blending in with your environment. So it just, you're hard to see. Nobody can see you, then they can't eat you, right? So that's that's one of the things um, that insects can do. This insect down here, uh, a giant leopard moth, if you look really closely, you can see this little bead of yellow liquid here. So this moth is disturbed right now and she's releasing this little chemical and that is foul smelling and foul tasting. So it, it tastes bad and it smells bad. And that's hopefully going to deter any predators from wanting to eat that. So that is a defense mechanism that insects can use. Here's our buck moth caterpillar again. This is a little bit of a different view. And you can see all of these spikes on here and these hairs. So these hairs can actually break off in your skin. They're called urticating hairs and they can cause irritation and they'll break off in, in any animal skin. And in some cases, these other um, structures here actually have venom in them. So they can actually poke your skin and inject a little bit of venom. And that can also cause an irritation on your skin. So Sometimes they're just going to arm themselves completely on the outside, which is probably a good idea, right? Because if this guy didn't have this armor, these spikes and urticating hairs on the outside, it's basically a walking sausage, right? It'd be pretty tasty for anybody to eat. Um, I see somebody also put in the chat stinger bite. Yeah. So up here we have a carpenter bee. This animal has the ability to sting and it can use that sting defensively to scare off and, and protect itself. Um, we don't see that um, the solitary species of bees and wasps sting as much as the social ones. So the social wasps and um, would be like yellow jackets, bald face hornets, and paper wasps those guys are really, really likely to sting you. Um, and the reason is, is that that stinger is actually a modified ovipositor. So an ovipositor is what a female insect uses to lay eggs. Um, and because in social situations, those workers aren't laying any of the eggs, that, that ovipositor has now become modified purely for defense and offense. And so that's why the social species are way more likely to sting you. The solitary species can sting you with that stinger, with that ovipositor, but because they need that in order to lay eggs, they're much less likely. They don't want to risk losing it. They don't want to risk not being able to lay eggs. So the solitary species are much less likely. Now, that isn't to say that you should go around trying to, you know, make friends with all the bees and wasps because some of us are allergic um, and it does hurt. Um, but just, just food for thought. Um, and then, so some insects will actually mimic, mimic other insects that can hurt you. So we talked about that already down here with the robber fly. The robber fly is trying to look like a bumblebee that maybe is pretty friendly and won't bother you. Um, and that's doing that in order to 
to catch prey, right? But this guy up here, this is a, a locust borer. It's a type of beetle. Um, this is actually trying to mimic a wasp because it's trying to scare away other insects or other predators that might try to eat it. It's trying to convince them that it's actually a wasp and it's going to sting them if they attack it. Um, so we've got all kinds of tools here. We've got we've got camouflage. We've got um, physical like spikes and spines. We've got chemical defenses and we've got mimicry. All of these things that these insects can use um, to help defend themselves. Now, what are some insect jobs? Why are they important? Why do we care about them? Um, so, I mean, I think they're pretty cool. I don't think they need to have a job in order to be important, um, but they do do a lot of stuff for us. So one of the biggest ones I already mentioned is pollination. So in order for our plants, any of our plants that um, require insect pollination to produce seeds, they need to have pollen moved from one flower to another. That's how those plants reproduce and are able to produce fruit and nuts. Um, and then many of our plants that is mediated by insects. So I mentioned that flies can do it, beetles can do it, butterflies and moths can do it. Um, and a lot of bees, we have a lot of bees that can do that. There's over 400 different kinds of bees in New York state alone. Um, and, you know, we we talk a lot about honeybees doing that service for us, but it turns out that our native pollinators are actually way better at pollinating a lot of plants and some of our crops than the honeybees are. Um, so they're really essential. And, you know, I, I say, you know, you think about um, things that would disappear with bees and some of them seem pretty obvious, you know, blueberries, maybe watermelons or tomatoes, but they're are other things that you might not realize like coffee and chocolate. Those aren't from here, right? We get those from, from South America, um, but those plants are pollinated by insects. Um, so without that, we'd lose a lot of our food. Um, we talked a little bit too, when we were talking about the dung beetles about decomposition. So these guys are nature scavengers. They're, they're the trash people, the trash men um, of the, the natural world. And they go around and take care of um, corpses. So road kills or poop. It's a dirty job, but somebody has got to do it. Right. And these insects are really, really good at it. This is a type of insect called a carrion beetle. And they actually find dead and decaying animals and they they dig underneath them to pull them underground and then they lay their eggs. And then as those eggs hatch and the larvae develop, the parents take care of them. They actually have a lot of parental care and take care of these young while they're feeding on this carcass underneath the ground. And so that's a huge service, right? I wouldn't really want to see the world if we didn't have decomposers. Um, also seed dispersal. So pictured here is an ant um, and ants uh, collect seeds. Sometimes the, the plants trick insects into collecting seeds by putting a little sugar coating on the seed, or sometimes they'll put a, a really fatty, nutritious um, deposit on the seed called an elizome. Um, And so the ants will collect the seeds for that little deposit and they'll carry them back to their nests and inevitably not all of the seeds are eaten. And so they help to disperse those seeds and plant those seeds. So that's really important. And also we are using insects these days in what we call biocontrol. So if you've ever heard of um, invasive species, these are species that are introduced from other places that are, so they're species that are not native here and they become invasive because they don't have any of their native um, uh, insects or predators or herbivores that are kind of keep their pop their populations in check in their native range. They get out of whack when they come here and they don't have that suite of predators that are going to keep their populations in check. So biocontrols are when we go to the country of origin for some of these species, so where these species are from, and we figure out what's eating them in their native range. And we bring those insects over here to try and maintain, trying to keep their populations in check. So this is a plant called spotted knapweed. Um, it's, it is kind of, it, it is invasive. It tends to take over and it puts chemicals in the soil that prevents other plants from growing around it. And so it really tends to kind of replace native plants. And so this is a beetle that was introduced, a, a type of beetle called a weevil 
that was introduced, it actually lays its eggs in the flower and the larvae develop in that seed head and eat the seeds. So it really works to slow this plant down and slow its spread. So obviously really, really important. Um, again, maybe, maybe not in our daily lives that we're aware of, but maybe more so than we know. All right, so we may not always see insects, but sometimes we might see signs of insects, right? So um, we talked a little bit before about sound. So many times these insects are really well camouflaged. And so we don't, we might not actually see them, but we can hear them. Um, and hopefully we'll, you know, we're gonna get out of this uh, winter and uh, we'll start hearing those insects singing again. I will say it kind of takes a while for them to start singing. You'll usually start hearing um, insects starting to sing in the in the summer. Um, but we can also look for insect homes. So those might be nests. So here's um, some nests of bees that you might see. So this, um, each one of these little hills here is a nest. Now you might think that this is a social species and this might seem kind of frightening, but each one of these is one nest. There's a female in each one of these nests. Um, and they've just kind of aggregated here. They've just kind of gone to this spot because they see other bees are nesting here. So it must be a good spot, right? They like they like living together, um, but they're, they're not social. Each one is doing her own thing. And if you were to go look up close at each one of these nests, you might see a little bee kind of poking her head out of her nest. So we can look for their nests. Um, you might see um, leaf rolling. So some insects will roll leaves around them um, to protect them. You might see galls. Sometimes galls are the result of bacteria or fungus, but many times galls are formed around insects. An egg is laid in the plant tissue and the plant kind of makes a tumor around that insect to protect itself. And that insect gets a nice little house that's full of food and it gets to sit in there. Um, so you can see these galls and um, when the insect is ready to come out, it just kind of chews a little hole in the side and flies away. Um, this is a house from a caddisfly. That's a, uh, one of our aquatic um, insects. They actually use silk to kind of sew together um, sticks, grasses, plants, maybe small stones to make little houses that they actually pull around behind them. Um, so they can stay in this little house. You can find these houses after these insects um, have left them behind. Um, this is a cool insect. Um, this looks like a little straw hat, right? Um, this is the adult beetle over here. And there's actually a larva, a larval beetle underneath this straw hat. But this straw hat is made out of poop. It makes a little hat for itself out of its own poop. So it can get left alone. So no predator's really gonna wanna eat the poop to get to it, right? Um, and so it protects it and camouflages it. So those are some of the signs that we might uh, look for for insects. A few other ones that I wanted to show you, um, if you've ever pulled the bark back from a tree, you might see these beautiful engravings in the bark. And these are made by pine engraver beetles. So these are larvae and these are the tunnels that they make as they're feeding on the wood, as they're traveling through and feeding on the wood. They can be really, really beautiful. Um, this is one of my favorite signs of insects, these circles cut out of leaves. These are made by leaf cutter bees. So leaf cutter bees, um, as the name suggests, they cut leaves and they line their nests with those pieces of leaves. Um, and they do that to kind of waterproof and protect the nest. Um, and it kind of keeps bacteria and fungus out too. So you, if you have, if you see these nice like hole punch leaves like this, chances are you have a leaf cutter bee nesting somewhere. And then, you know, sometimes the signs are a little less obvious. You might see this on a stem and not even realize that it's housing something. It just looks like some dirt kind of on a stem, right? But when you clear that away underneath, you find ants and aphids. So what we saw back here was actually a barn that these ants built to protect the aphids. They farm the aphids like cows. So the aphids are sucking the juices out of the plant and they produce a sugary substance that the ants harvest. So in return, the ants protect the aphids. They build a little barn around them and they patrol around and kind of keep predators and keep them clean, keep predators away from them. So kind of cool <laughs> that they can interact in that way. 
All right. I want to just finish off tonight by talking about how we can help insects at home. Um, so some of that is just about letting it be. Um, you know, we think that, you know, this might look like a weed to us, but to insects, that's a flowering plant and that's that's habitat. So just leaving plants where they grow and and letting the letting the habitat grow naturally or letting your lawn go fallow can be uh, really, really helpful to insects. You can provide nesting areas for insects. Some of them will nest if you provide, you can provide butterfly houses where they can rest. Um, this is a bee house that I made. It's just two by fours with holes drilled of different sizes for different size bees to nest in. You can even just leave bare ground. A lot of insects nest in bare ground. Um, or the opposite of that, leaf litter. So you've probably heard some or seen some um, things that talk about leaving the leaf litter this spring. A lot of insects overwinter in the leaf litter. So don't, you know, give it a while before you rake your leaves. Let those insects wake up and leave their winter homes before you kind of displace them. Um, also chemicals, you know, we use a lot of chemical, we, we use chemicals, you know, for a lot of reasons. And, you know, maybe we're using the, that chemical for a very specific reason, but we're finding out more and more that a lot of the chemicals that we use to control one thing have really poor, bad effects on other things that we didn't intend to happen. So the best way to get rid of those non, what we call them non-target effects, is to just not use the chemicals. You can, if you have weeds, you can hand pull them or better yet, let them be because they're habitat, right? Um, and I threw this up here, the Homegrown National Park. This is a really cool concept that basically there is more land area in the United States in lawns, in people's privately owned lawns than there is in national parks. So we can more than double the size of our national parks in this country if everybody tries to let their lawn go natural. So get rid of all that grass. That grass is a desert to our insects. It's it's not really helping our insects at all. Um, so maybe turn some of your yard into natural habitat. Let it go fallow and just mow it once a year. Let some native plants get established. Um, and you can, if you decide to do that, you can actually register your yard with the Homegrown National Park um, and increase this, this kind of citizen science movement to create habitat um, for insects. Our, our insects are declining and we, we, we really need to do everything that we can. And what, what I have found is if you build it, they will come. You know, If we provide them the habitat, what they need to survive, then they'll be there, they'll come back. Um, so let's do it. Um, so that's all I had for you guys tonight. I hope that was fun and informative for you. I'm going to stick on if anybody has any questions. I'll check the chat or um, you can unmute yourself. What are you doing? What am I doing? Uh, I'm giving a I'm giving a talk about insects to some 4-Hers. I was talking to my mom. <laughs> I figured I was being funny. <laughs> Dylan, there's been a lot of questions in the chat about like, can caterpillars sting more than once? Can different types of bees sting more than once? Can you yeah. talk about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, great question. Yes, so those, yes, those things can sting more than once. So the caterpillars, um, all those hairs are what's kind of going to hurt, right? And um, they, so you, if you, if you touch one, it's not like it's, it's not like oh, I touched it and I already got stung. It can't sting again. It can sting again. Um, and you know, in some cases, you know, like um, bees and wasps, they do have venom in their stings. Um, and it does kind of take time to to make that venom, basically. So in some cases, you could get stung by a bee um, and then the venom is gone and it, it can sting you again, but it'll just be a stab because there isn't any venom. Um, but most of our bees and wasps can sting multiple times um, and they don't necessarily release all the venom in the first sting. So it's it's better to just be careful. Um, honeybees are the, the species that, um, they actually will break off the stinger in your skin. Um, so that's kind of like a 
true sacrifice to the to the bigger organism, right? To the colony. So they're they're stinging you and they're breaking that stinger off in your skin. And hopefully that's going to release more of that venom. It's going to be more painful and it's going to scare you away. But the downside of that is that that individual bee kind of rips out the end of their abdomen. So they do actually die after they sting you. But most of our bees are able to sting more than once. Bees and wasps. Um, let's see. Did you see the question about school? Um, did you go to college to learn about insects? I did. Yes. So I went to um, I went to the State University of New York um, College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Um, it's in Syracuse, New York. And I took a lot of entomology classes there. And then I got uh, I stayed and got my master's degree um, studying native bees and wasps. So, yeah, I did go to school for it. Highly recommend. How do insects get their wings? Um, that's an interesting question because I'm not sure if you're asking like how did flight evolve in insects, which is a highly debated topic among scientists, um, or whether or not you're like you know how as they develop, how do they develop their wings? Um, so I'm gonna I'll go to the how do they develop their wings first. So if you if you look at this insect here, let me go back to the nymph. You can see that this this nymph of a damselfly does actually have little tiny wings here. They're not functional. We call them wing pads. Um, and so they have all of the body parts when they're when they hatch out of the eggs. And um, as they grow, those get bigger and bigger. And in fact, um, let me go back to this. You can actually see here in this illustration for. Um, the uh, grasshopper, that they actually have smaller wings when they're younger. And as they get bigger, those wings get bigger and bigger. So that's actually a way that you can age some um, crickets and grasshoppers is by looking at the length of the wings. If the wings are longer than the abdomen, it's probably an adult. If they're shorter than the abdomen, then it's probably a young one. Um, but in our damselfly here, those, those wing pads don't get expanded until they come out. And you can see here they are here and they're basically all kind of really tightly folded up. And what happens when they um, leave this last exoskeleton, they do this last molt, is they pump a bunch of hemolymph or, or blood, insect blood into those wings and that causes them to expand. And so that's where we see what we see happening here. So these ones are pretty wet still. They still have a lot of that hemolymph and then they're gonna dry. And we see that also with the butterflies as well. You can kind of see here in the illustration, these wings are really, really crumpled. Um, but these guys, when you have complete metamorphosis, it's pretty crazy what happens uh, inside of this chrysalis. Um, they kind of, they they just kind of, rework their whole bodies inside of there. We're still, scientists are still trying to understand. There was a thought that they almost turned to soup inside of that chrysalis and then kind of everything got realigned and moved around and then re-solidified. Now we're finding more so that there are parts on the caterpillars themselves that are going to just be repurposed inside of that chrysalis and turn into different things. Um, so we're still really learning that. Um, as far as, uh, how they developed flight or why they got flight. There's there's two theories. One is that it was from gliding. So they were up high and they started falling out of trees and needed to catch themselves. Um, the other thought is, is from the ground up in order to like escape predators. They were running and jumping. And when they started developing these wings, they were able to jump farther. And then finally they were able to fly. We don't really know <laughs> which way. Maybe it was both ways and, and different insects developed it differently. But that's a really great question. This is so fascinating. Um, we, ha <clears throat> we have another question, but I had a quick one. Do you have any recommendations on where kids can go to learn more about insects on their own? Oh, that's a good question. I would go to your local nature centers. Like chances are that they are doing programs on insects um, because they're super easy to see. They're so prevalent, right? They're, they're in our, like, we see them all the time. So I would probably try to find, you know, a local nature center or reach out to Cornell Cooperative Extension <laughs> um, for opportunities. Um, I think that'd be a great place to start. Thank you. Someone was curious about where you work. I threw in the Albany Pine Bush Preserve. 
but I didn't yeah. know if you wanted to add anything to that. Yeah, I so I work at the Albany Pine Bush Preserve. It's it's a Pine Barrens ecosystem. We're located between Albany and Schenectady. Um, we got about thirty five hundred acres, and I I showed that picture of the Carner Blue before. That's the species that we really work to maintain and restore on the landscape. And so we do a lot of work here and research um, to look at the restoration of the habitat in that particular species. Um, and we look at a lot of other insects too, because there are a lot of rare insects that can only be found here. And so their indication on the their presence on the landscape is an indication to us that we're doing a good job in like restoring and maintaining this place. So I get to do a lot of insect work. <laughs> All right. Does anyone else have a question for Dylan? I see we still have a handful of people here. The first insect. Um, you, the mayflies and the stoneflies? Is that what you mean by first? You can unmute if you want. Oh. oh, first insect ever. Ooh, that is a good question. I think, I, I think it's probably, I don't think it still exists. I think maybe one of the close relatives to it might be a springtail, which are teeny, 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 tiny. There's sometimes, um, you can see them on the, on um, in the spring on the water as they look like little grains of pepper on the water. And they're called springtails because they have like a little spring loaded um, furculum that they use to kind of spring away. Um, so they kind of jump really, really far. Um, they're pretty cool insects, but very, very small. And I want to say that those are some, that maybe some of the oldest ones. Some of the oldest ones, actually, you might also see in your house too, some of the oldest insects are silverfish and bristletails. So you these guys you see a lot in like old houses. I mean, not even old houses, just houses. Um, and whenever I see one, you know, I think some people, you know, they're like, oh, I don't want them. And I think they they can be pests if they if you have a lot of them. But I'm usually pretty, I think it's pretty cool to see one because that's a pretty ancient insect. Yes, you can see them on the snow. Yeah. Yep. Well, this has been incredible. I'm sure everyone learned a lot. I learned a ton and I have a little bit of information about insects already and now even more. Awesome. Do we have any final questions? Yes. All right. Oh, what do we have? One more? Is Ooh, there a type of bug that likes the cold? Hmm. <laughs> so there are some insects. Um, uh, there's s s things called snow fleas. Um, there's winter scorpion flies. There's something called a winter moth. But these are mostly insects that just kind of happen to be out when it's cold. You want to unplug the, the TV cold first? is not super good for insects.